Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I think that we will begin. My name is Joseph Kearney, and it is a great privilege for me as Dean of Marquette University Law School to welcome you to Eckstein Hall and our Lubar Center. The occasion, of course, is our annual George and Margaret Barak Lecture on Criminal Law. Let me begin by saying a few words about the individuals whose memory we honor through this lecture. George Barak was a Marquette lawyer. He was born in 1907, the child of immigrants from the area now known as Lebanon, and graduated in our class of 1931. His practice in Milwaukee emphasized family law. George's wife, Margaret Barak, was part of his professional life as well, helping to run the law office. Their late daughter, Mary Bonfield, made a bequest to support an occasional distinguished lecture in George and Margaret Barak's memory. For more than a decade, we have annually dedicated that lecture to criminal law. This was not George Barak's own specialty, but it is of a piece with his practice in its engagement with and it's so fundamentally affecting a substantial number of individual citizens. Certainly, its importance in the law and society cannot be doubted. Not surprisingly, then, criminal law is an historic strength of Marquette University Law School. This has been the case for scores of years in our teaching and our graduates' practices, and in recent decades as well in terms of our faculty's scholarly attention. So, in a variety of ways, this annual lecture honors the past, present, and future of Marquette Law School. This year, we are most fortunate to welcome, as our Barack lecturer, Daryl Brown. He is the O.M. Vickers Professor and the Baron F. Black Research Professor at the University of Virginia School of Law. Professor Brown has taught numerous different courses in the area of criminal law, both at the University of Virginia where he has been a faculty member since 2007, and for a decade or so before that, at Washington and Lee University School of Law. He is an active and engaged scholar. His most recent book from Oxford University Press is Free Market Criminal Justice, How Democracy and Laissez-Faire Undermine the Rule of Law. His background includes work both in commercial litigation and as a public defender in Georgia. I would tell you more about him, but he's right here and prepared to take up the topic, the dilemma of discretion. Which offenses should prosecutors charge? And after he has sorted that out, he will be glad to take some questions. Won't you please welcome to Milwaukee and Marquette Law School for this year's Barack Lecture, Professor Darrell Brown. Thank you immensely. This is a real honor for me. It's also my first trip to Wisconsin, but I have many um, connections, professional and personal. In Wisconsin. I have in-laws in, in, in Wisconsin and good criminal law colleagues um, that I've known from afar for many years. And I know many of the predecessors who have given this lecture, and I'm very uh, honored and a bit intimidated to be in their company um, and to be in yours as well. I, I told a group of lawyers that, that I talked with today at lunch, I'm always intimidated to um, speak to actual practicing lawyers, which I haven't been in about 20 years, hold aside amicus briefs because you guys actually know what's going on in the world and, and, and what you're talking about. And it's harder to fool you than it is to fool law professors. Um, and so I'm going to talk about prosecutors in a room, I suspect, with a lot of prosecutors in it. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about judges, relationships to prosecutors in a room that has some judges in it. Um, so there's probably a, not a time when prosecutors are not uh, in the news, but there's, there's some interesting ways that prosecutors have been in the news in recent years that are the um, basis for this talk and this uh, article I'll uh, eventually finish writing. Um, so some of it's very high profile stuff that you find in the news, right? There, there's significant policy changes from administration to administration at the federal level, from the, most recently from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. If you're a lawyer who follows these things at least, right, or if you're in an industry where it matters, 
there's a big there's a big change in the um, federal enforcement of marijuana laws in states where there's legal uh, and state regulation of, of the marijuana industry, um, and an even bigger, high profile, more high profile change in policy in the so-called DACA and DAPA policies, right? The forbearance or the non-prosecution, non-deportation policies of the Obama administration with respect to undocumented immigrants who either came here as children or who are adults but have US citizen children. Um, and you hear about a lot of prosecutor news at the state and local level as well, and especially there's been a lot of um, innovative policies, a lot of maybe controversial policies adopted by uh, and announced by local prosecutors around, um, around the country in, in various ways, a lot of them taking the form of, of non-prosecution policies or uh, different, uh, less severe prosecution policies. Um, and it's fair to say there's a lot of controversy around both of those kind of realms of federal and state prosecution um, policy because what prosecutors do is policy and it's really important policy that, that matters a lot to people and people tend to have a lot, of, a lot of feelings about. Prosecutors can make those policies and generate this kind of public discussion because they have almost complete discretion, right, to, to charge or to not charge crimes in our system, right? There's almost no legal regulation no restriction by law as to what prosecutors can charge as long as there's a criminal offense in the code and the prosecutor has evidence sufficient to support a charge under a given provision, right? As long as there's sufficient evidence to initiate the charge, technically probable cause, but really if they have enough evidence likely to convict. Um, if they have those two things, right, they can do almost anything they want. They can charge to the full extent of the code or they can charge not at all or anywhere in between. Um, and so I think it's fair to say, this is not original, that the, our, the regulation of prosecutorial discretion in the United States, state and federal, right, is, is political, or maybe the nicer way to put it is demo through democratic accountability, rather than through legal regulation, right, it's possible to have, legislatures could enact sort of guidelines and regulations for prosecutorial discretion, the same way they do for judicial sentencing discretion, right? There's nothing unconstitutional about that, but you never see that in any state or federal jurisdiction. So prosecutors have this tremendous um, discretion. It's largely a matter of their policy judgment with the, just these sort of outer parameters with respect to sufficient evidence and, and crimes in the, in the code. So there's a lot to say about how prosecutors are to exercise that discretion. That's what a lot of the public discussion is about. Um, it triggers a lot of debates about tough on crime or effective smart on crime policies or the cap social consequences of, of, of rigorous versus um, more lenient uh, policies. Um, I'm leaving all that aside for the most part to focus on one particular source of, of guidance and restrictions or authority for prosecutorial discretion. Um, and that source is legislatures or legislation and criminal laws and the legislative intent behind the criminal laws and punishment statutes that are the foundation for prosecution in the criminal justice system. Um, and I want to make sort of three points that suggest both that prosecutors aren't as constrained as we think they are and we think there's quite little constraint on them, uh, and that criminal legislation, criminal law, in at least one respect, puts more restraint and a significant, or should be a significant constraint in some context for some offenses, um, on prosecutorial discretion. So my thesis is going to have three, three points sort of built on three examples of, I think, relatively familiar, sometimes high profile examples of prosecutorial policies in, in recent years. Um, point one is about at the upper limit of charging. So although legislation doesn't, again, limit prosecutorial discretion by imposing guidelines or permitting judicial review of prosecutor decisions and the like, criminal statutes cabin what prosecutors can charge. They can only charge offenses that are in the code. And legislative purpose or intent behind many of those statutes sometimes is quite clear as to how those char charges should be charged or the extent to which those charges should be charged. 
Um, and they do, in fact, put some constraints, or should be understood to put some constraints on prosecutorial charging policies. So properly understood, there's a sort of upper limit on charging. There's a, a, a limit from criminal legislation beyond which prosecutors shouldn't go for some offenses. Um, point two is about sort of the lower limit on charging, or maybe more precisely on declination or non-charging decisions, right? So all the legislation never explicitly mandates that prosecutors have to charge. There's no mandatory prosecution legal obligation in US jurisdictions. There is in some European jurisdictions, like Germany, but not, not anywhere in the common law world. Um, there's never a mandatory charging obligation, right? But there's at least a debate about whether prosecutors have an obligation to charge to some degree or to a good faith degree, right? There's a constitutional basis in the federal system and differently in state constitutions, including the Wisconsin Constitution, that the executive branch, state constitutions, it tends to just be the governor who's somewhat politically separate from the local prosecutors. But the executive branch, the presidency in the federal system and the governor in the state system have a take care duty to take care that the, that the laws are faithfully executed. That's one basis right, for an argument that prosecutors have some duty to enforce the criminal law. There's a lower limit beyond which they cannot go. They can't just ignore criminal law and choose not to enforce the criminal law that the legislature enacts. Right? The legislature determines what the policy will be in a given jurisdiction about whether X conduct will be criminal. And there's an argument that, there's a, that prosecutors have an, some obligation to enforce those criminal laws. I don't agree with that. I think it's relatively clear. I think it's not a radical position to say prosecutors don't, in fact, have that obligation and that they, do, they are empowered to completely ignore or to completely announce as a matter of policy they will not enforce particular offenses. Um, but there's some debate about that, and I want to touch on that question of whether there's a lower limit on prosecutor charging discretion. And then point three touches on the seemingly incontrovertible limits, I think, uh, that legislation imposes on criminal charging and prosecutorial discretion. It turns out to have some significant exceptions that sound really radical when you put them bluntly. All the courts in many states, including Wisconsin, put them this bluntly. Right? The pair of the limits are that everyone agrees that can find prosecutors, right? despite there's no guidance or regulation of prosecutorial discretion. Everyone agrees they can only charge crimes that are defined in legislation in criminal codes, and that they can only prosecute when they have evidence sufficient to support a charge for one of those offenses defined in the code. Right? You can't charge a person with assault when the evidence shows they committed securities fraud or burned an American flag. You can't invent uh, the offense of burning an American flag. Right? Yet it turns out Prosecutors do, in Wisconsin and many other states, occasionally violate both of those fundamental constraints on prosecutorial power from criminal law legislation. Um, that is that they charge people for crimes without evidence sufficient to prove their guilt, and occasionally with offenses that don't exist in the jurisdiction's criminal code. And I want to suggest that in the right circumstances, it's okay for them to do so, and that they, they do, in fact, win convictions in those cases, and that in the context in which they're able to do that, that there's a plausible argument that that's an appropriate thing to do. Um, so all three points then address kind of the relationship, some relationship between prosecutorial and legislative or executive power, right, when prosecutors should be bound by legislation that can be in, a limit that can be inferred from criminal statutes, when prosecutors are free to ignore legislation or not enforce legislation, even though the legislature has set that as state policy. Um, and when they can, effect, in fact, resist or avoid the limitations that the legislature has defined in the criminal code by defining only a certain set of offenses as offenses within the jurisdiction. The prosecutors clearly do all three of those things now. They charge some criminal statutes that I think there's good evidence are not intended to be charged in the way that they are, uh, not intended by the legislature to be charged in the way that they are, that they explicitly decline to prosecute entire class of offenses, 
I'll suggest that's appropriate. I think that's the least, maybe the least controversial point. And that they successfully charge offenses that are either not in the criminal code or not, are not supported by, by good evidence. My argument for these three practices right, is that the first one, again, should be a more rigorous, should be understood to be a more significant limitation on prosecutorial power than it is, that the second practice of not enforcing some offenses is perfectly legitimate, uh, and that the third one, well, one that sort of sounds most radical on its face, is appropriate and legitimate in, in at least some circumstances. Um, and that we have at least legislative acquiescence to that practice, right? The legislature could intervene and stop these practices, but they haven't. Um, so the first point, thesis one and the topic one, right? The le le legislation limits the extent or the range of criminal law enforcement for certain statutes, right? Legislatures write statutes against the background of prosecutors having discretion. They would write some statutes differently if they knew prosecutors were under some mandatory obligation to enforce them in every case in which they have evidence, but they know they're not. They depend on prosecutorial discretion and write statutes in a particular way because they know prosecutors exercise discretion. There's lots of examples of statutes where that's relatively clear and where the legislature clearly depends on, legis on prosecutors not enforcing the statute in every case in which they would apply, not enforcing the literal language of the statute, not enforcing them even in cases of very clear violations of, of, the, of the particular offense. Right? So maybe the most high profile federal example of that is the federal, uh, there's a federal main justice or justice department policy for the US federal prosecutors around the country. Um, to charge, with various exceptions, it's a longer memo and longer policy guidance, but the core of it is that US attorneys are under an obligation to prosecute the most serious, readily provable offense in every case, again, subject to some exceptions, some exceptions that mostly don't affect the ultimate outcome in terms of sentencing or, or uh, quantity of punishment. So that particular kind of policy would be problematic, I would suggest it is problematic, in the case of statutes that are not intended to be fully enforced, not intended to be <coughs> prosecuted in every case in which prosecutors can prove violations of those, of those statutes. Sometimes legislatures make it quite clear that we're enacting a particular statute. We recognize it's overbroad, not in an unconstitutional sense, but that it covers conduct that we don't think should be punished even though it fits the language of the statute. So if you look at the New York RICO statute, the organized crime statute in New York, it's quite blunt and explicit in this way. The, the RICO statute, it's very hard to, to define organized crime and racketeering activity. And the New York legislature did their best. It looks a lot like the federal statute. Um, but then they add attachments to the offense definition to say it's impossible to precisely define what the statute is aiming at. It can't, it can't readily be codified in terms of restrictive definitions and categorical lists of exceptions. And so the legislature overtly, specifically, in writing in the statute, says the prosecutors ought to exercise discretion in charging this offense. Once the letter of the law is met, the question is whether the prosecutor, question for the prosecutors, essentially one of fairness and appropriateness in the particular case, the answer will depend on the particular situation. And that's just an unusually blunt and forthright acknowledgement by the legislature that they have a statute that could be enforced much more broadly than they, um, than they intended to be, and that it depends on prosecutor discretion to fulfill the legislative intent of how the statute should be enforced. You can look at some sexual assaults, sexual contact, offenses in various states, depending on how they're charged, right? You can find the same kind of problem or over-expansiveness, over right? There are some statutes that define kissing as sexual contact and apply to people under 18, and so it can be read to technically to criminalize kissing between two 15-year-olds, say. That clearly, I think, is not intended by the legislature to be enforced in that kind of context. The most high-profile example, at least for those familiar with federal practice and who Notice these sorts, sorts of things are some federal drug statutes, very frequently commonly enforced federal drug statutes. 
for the federal lawyers in the room, it's 21 U.S.C. 841 and Section 851, right? 841 just defines various drug offenses and the mandatory minimum sentences for those offenses that increase with the quantity or the amount of drugs at issue and type of drugs at issue uh, and whether the offender has prior convictions or not. Right? These are the kind of notoriously tough federal drug statutes. They get a lot of work. Um, those statutes, by definition, eliminate a lot of judicial dis sentencing discretion. That's their, that's their function, even on top of what the sentencing guidelines do. But Congress paired this statute with Section 851, which basically puts the trigger for the enhancement for the greater penalties for the mandatory minimums in the prosecutor's hands. So 851 says no person shall be sentenced to the increased punishment, to find another in 841, by reason of prior conviction unless the U.S. attorney files an information with the court stating and writing the reasons for the, prior con the previous convictions to be relied upon, right? So basically just a, a statute with a lot, some really tough provisions, but it's in prosecutor's discretion to file those, um, to trigger those uh, sharper penalties. So 851 is just a recognition by Congress that Section 841, the basic drug statutes and, and sentencing provisions, should not be enforced in every case that fit its terms, right? That the legislation that discretion is needed for that piece of legislation to distinguish from some cases from others and uh, uh, on the grounds that the criminal statutes don't specify in its terms, right? That Congress recognize that elements of the offense and the related sentencing factors, the quantity and the criminal record are too crude, they're, they're more um, overbroad or they reach further than, should, than is appropriate for enforcement in every case that, that fit their terms. And so Congress gave discretionary power to prosecutors in Section 851 to sort out the cases that really deserve to be sanctioned under the terms of 841 versus those that, those that don't. So there's a lot of criticism from federal judges in particular, as well as outside observers, including criminal law professors, that federal prosecutors in a lot of jurisdictions at least don't exercise that discretionary authority for the purpose for which it was intended. And the legislative history here, the congressional history, is quite clear. This statute was enacted in the early 70s when the Justice Department went back to Congress and said, you know, you have these mandatory minimums and they don't give us any discretion to use them and don't give the judges any discretion. They don't fit every case. You need to give us discretion so that we can charge the enhanced penalties in the cases of the sort of the worst drug dealers, the biggest time drug dealers, the kingpins, and not in every, in every case. Congress chose the sort of crude proxy of type of drug and quantity of drug, which doesn't match especially well with sort of worst offender status or kingpin status. And so it's that exercise of discretion that's supposed to make sure that serious drug penalties go to the, kind of the kingpins and the worst offenders or the biggest dealers, and not to the lower level people. Um, so it's quite clear that was Congress's intent in creating, in putting discretion in prosecutors' hands, and quite clear that just, the Justice Department's intent in asking for it was so that they could allocate those penalties between the worst offenders and the, and the less worst offenders. So there's lots of evidence for that, and lo lots of evidence that judges recite when they criticize these sorts of uh, sentencing decisions that the statute compels them to enforce after prosecutors' charges. Um, And lots of evidence that federal prosecutors don't exercise that discretionary authority now, at least in the last 20 years or more, um, in the way that it was originally intended, right, to distinguish the worst from the less worse drug dealer offenders. There's lots of evidence um, that they use it really as a tool for uh, leveraging plea bargains quickly or from extracting information from lower level offenders. Most of the time that works, when threatened with uh, enhanced penalties through 851. Lower level people will flip and provide them whatever information they have or they'll accept a guilty plea. Um, but sometimes they don't and sometimes they don't have adequate information and then prosecutors end up having to follow through on their threat or using the heavy stick of 851 to put really harsh penalties on offenders who are pretty low level dealers and pretty low level drug offenders. Um, 
So this kind of statute then, right, for my purposes, is just an especially clear example, given its especially clear legislative history, and which was clear both in the Justice Department and to Congress, that this is a criminal statute for which the legislative intent was that it not be enforced to the, to the full extent of the letter of the offense, right, to the letter of the letter of the statute. It was not built, in other words, for a policy in which the Justice Department enforces it in every time they have a provable offense, right? It doesn't fit the charge, the most serious, readily provable offense policy that drives some U.S. attorney policies with respect to enforcement of these, of these drug statutes. That's one example of legislation that should set an upper limit, that is intended to set an upper limit on prosecutorial discretion that is something less than full enforcement of the letter of the statute. There's no enforceability in the sense of judicial review or a motion you can make against prosecutorial discretion. But I suggest that the legislative intent of those statutes should be a source for prosecutors not using those statutes beyond the way the legislature intended, which would be some of the applications quite in many cases that we've seen in the last 10 or 20 years, I think. That's the upper limit piece. That's the argument that some legislation, criminal law enacted by the legislature, is clearly intended to put some limit or at least some guidance on prosecutorial discretion. Question in scenario two, right, does legislation mandate some minimal level of enforcement? Are prosecutors free to ignore some criminal statutes or decide not to enforce some criminal statutes? I think the answer is clearly yes. I think lots of prosecutors agree because lots of prosecutors have that policy. And there's clearly nothing in American law, state or federal law, that forbids that literally as a matter of positive law. There's no constitutional law under the Take Care Clause that, by which the President and the Justice Department and the federal system or state prosecutors can be made to prosecute in context when they, when they aren't prosecuting. Um, and nothing that restricts them from having a policy of non-prosecution. That said, there's lots of jurisdictions that have that, those kinds of policies, right? A few local prosecutors in my own state of Virginia have decided not to prosecute kind of simple low-level marijuana possession cases. Some prosecutors in much bigger, more high-profile cities like Brooklyn and, and Philadelphia have the same kind of policy. At least in Virginia, they get a fair amount of pushback from that, both from their local bench, from local judges, and from the police department, which keeps making the arrest for the charges that the prosecutors won't pursue, and the judges who keep allowing the police to bring in the defendants to arraign them and, and proceed in these simple possession cases, which you can do in the lower level Virginia court, without the prosecutor present. So while I think it's clear the prosecutors have the authority to do that, there's a lot of pushback and resistance to it. The federal example, right, is the DACA and DAPA non-prosecution policies for, again, for undocumented immigrants, especially those who are brought here as, as children, right? At their core, all those are is just non-prosecution policies or forbe forbearance policies, right? It's clear the executive branch has the power to do that. If there's a tremendous political discussion and political pushback, right, in that kind of, in that exercise of prosecutorial discretion one vein of which is that it's illegitimate or inappropriate for prosecutors to do that. Right? I think it's clear on the law, at least, that, the, that there's no legal dispute about the legitimacy and the power of prosecutors to do that. There, might, there can be a policy argument about whether it's the best policy to pursue, whether it's appropriate policy to pursue. It's possible for the legislature to intervene and compel enfor enforcement to mandate prosecution. They haven't done that. But there's no... There should be no question, I think, about the lower limit, right, or about a, a minimum obligation to prosecute, um, despite the controversies around some of these policies in some, in some jurisdictions and in the federal system. Um, and I think if you look at the history of how we have these kinds of policies that have played out, at least in recent years, where there have been, um, some of them, again, high profile and a, a few years standing, we have a little bit of track record. Right? They tend to be quite moderate policies. The federal policy was quite controversial, but the state prosecutor policies, when they announce these sorts of things, tend to be quite moderate, like non-prosecution of simple marijuana offenses. 
Um, you could put in a broader category of things like drug courts and other diversion programs, which at least in some forms are non-prosecution of people for whom the prosecutors have evidence of offenses that legislature has deemed to be criminal. Usually little controversy around those. Um, and I think it's fair to say as a general matter, a pretty good track record of those not being catastrophic policies or being in some cases quite, quite successful policies. Um, and I think as a matter of sort of legislative power versus executive or prosecutor power, right? there's nothing about these blanket non-enforcement policies that usurps legislative policymaking prerogatives. It's consistent with the legislature being the lawmaker and the prosecution or the executive branch having the enforcement discretion and enforcement policymaking power about how the laws will be enforced. Right? One key signal of that distinction, of that not infringing on legislative power, I think, by not enforcing the legislature's laws, is that non-enforcement is not nearly the same thing as legalization. Right? And so you can just ask any benefit of DACA, the federal DACA policy, right? The, the, even if they get the benefit of DACA and get some assurance that they won't be deported for some period of time, right? They don't have legal status in the United States, right? Ask any marijuana, legal marijuana operation in Colorado or Washington State or elsewhere, right? They're operating legally under state law, but they still have to worry about federal law, right? They're not legal under federal law, so can't use, have trouble using banks and the like. Um, forbearance or non-prosecution is not nearly the same thing as legalization. It's not nearly the same thing as changing the laws. The legislature still has the power to define the law. The prosecution has a lot of policy-making power in whether and how to enforce the law. The legislature really doesn't like the enforcement practice. One solution is the political process. The other solution is the legislature can enact legislation that mandates some enforcement level or changes the law otherwise. Third and final example, right? can prosecutors effectively resist or circumvent or avoid criminal legislation by charging offenses for which they don't have evidence? And uh, sometimes, occasionally, even offenses that don't exist in the jurisdiction's criminal code. Right? So there's a, a relatively uncontroversial set of examples, I think, of prosecutors avoiding some consequences that are attached to many uh, criminal offenses and criminal penalties today, but direct sentencing effects like mandatory minimum sentences or particular components that are parts of sentences. In the federal white collar context, you can be disqualified from doing business with the government if your corporation gets convicted of certain things. If the lowest level, you can kind of lose your, lose your license for certain driving offenses in addition to paying a fine or going to jail. So some things are direct consequences of the criminal punishment. Some things are collateral consequences, right? The most high-profile example of that in recent years, right, is, is immigration consequences or deportation consequences for people convicted of certain state or federal offenses in a, in a broad category of, of cases. There's plenty of examples, I think, of prosecutors in various jurisdictions responding to those mandatory consequences, criminal sanctions or collateral civil consequences, responding to those mandatory consequences by adjusting their charging policies. Some jurisdictions, prosecutors try to facilitate federal enforcement, federal immigration policy by making discretionary decisions that will provide a basis for deportation. In other jurisdictions, other cities, prosecutors have, again, explicit policies to when they can, when there's options for what to charge an offender with, to charge policies that will not trigger, and not provide a basis for federal, for federal deportation. Um, and in the sex registration, sex offender category, there's some examples of that as well, of prosecutors charging some offenses rather than others in order to avoid a defender qualifying for sex offender registration because even the prosecutor, beside the defendant, doesn't think that's a, appropriate for this offender or for, um, 
or a good public policy outcome. That part, I think, is relatively uncontroversial, choosing between different existing offenses in the code in order to avoid some legislative policies with respect to consequences. What's much more controversial, at least on its face, right, is charging particular offenses to generate those kinds of results, to, again, to avoid sex offender registration or deportation eligibility or um, severe mandatory sentence complications or whatever it might be, to avoid some consequence of charging offenses that the prosecutor doesn't have good, uh, good evidence for. And admittedly, doesn't have evidence to prove the offense to which they're, for which they're charging the defendant and uh, for which the defendant is eventually convicted. So that sounds radical put that way, right? I think when you hear these examples, many of you will know about this and, and um, and even if you don't, it's not quite as radical as it, as it sounds. Right, so prosecutors sometimes charge what we call, call baseless offenses, or uh, some people call them fictional offenses and fictional convictions, um, that courts have expressly, expressly, explicitly endorsed and approved in at least a dozen states, including Wisconsin, big states like New York and California, lots of different states. Um, as far as I can tell, only two states, and probably the federal system, two states explicitly bar this practice. Iowa is one, New Jersey is the other. Um, there was recently an effort in Ohio, which has this practice of um, to bar this practice of so-called fictional or, or baseless charges. And the Ohio Prosecutors Association lobbied hard against it. Some local judges, trial judges, argued against it. And the, uh, the state rulemaking authority, I think that's the Supreme Court in Ohio, <coughs> chose not to amend the rule to, to ban baseless charges. Um, so the catch is that in these exceptional scenarios, they always occur in the context of negotiated guilty pleas. Right? These cases start out as indictments for some proper legitimate offense that is, in fact, in the criminal code. And that for various reasons, during plea negotiations, and as the case progresses, prosecutors may find that their initial charge is a difficult one to prove, that their evidence is plausible but not strong for trial. Um, they may have problems, especially in sexual assault, sexual offense cases of diff difficult problems of not wanting to put a witness, uh, a victim and other witnesses through a trial. But for various reasons, they're willing to negotiate away the initial valid charge. And occasionally, the new charge does not exist in the criminal code. But if it's a basis for a negotiated guilty plea, a defendant will plead guilty to it. And a judge will accept it, again, in many states at least, uh, as what judges and state Supreme Courts describe explicitly. The most common term is a non-existent charge or a hypothetical charge in some states. So what are some examples of that, right? Um, for a, a, in one Ohio case I looked at, a rape charge replaced a, uh, in a negotiated plea, was replaced in a negotiated plea with a charge of sexual, with, with aggravated assault. It's plausible to think in general terms that a rape is a kind of specific form, particular kind of aggravated assault, but depending on how the statutes are drafted, it may not fit the aggravated assault criteria or elements, which is the case in Ohio. In Ohio, the aggravated assault charge requires the defendant to be acting in a, in a rage which was brought on by serious provocation occasioned by the victim that is reasonably sufficient to incite the person, incite the defendant. Right? So it's problematic just kind of from a victim perspective that, you're, that the rape defendant is convicted of a charge that in part blames the victim for inciting the, inciting the defendant. Um, but the more abstract point, right, is that the elements are distinct, right? The prosecution had some plausible element, some pl plausible evidence that was sufficient to bring the initial rape charge. They didn't have any evidence of at least some of the elements of the aggravated assault charge to which they eventually negotiated a, negotiated a, a resolution. Um, same thing in Wisconsin between the first degree of attempted homicide and a lesser felony. Uh, one defendant was convicted for aggravated battery based on a plea agreement. The aggravated battery requires proof of great bodily harm, attempted murder. 
may not require great bodily harm, right? The attempt may not get far enough to cause great bodily harm, or may not may be completed, but not take the form of great bodily harm. Um, so the prosecution can have plausible evidence, but not want to proceed for some reason on the attempted murder, attempted first degree homicide charge, settled for the aggravated battery charge, but have no evidence of great, great bodily harm. So courts permit these kinds of baseless pleas or fictional pleas for all sorts of um, offenses for which courts readily admit we're approving this conviction, entering a judgment of guilt, and then at the appellate level affirming the conviction on the, on the basis of the negotiated guilty plea. When there's no factual basis for the charge that the defendant's actually convicted of, um, and the typical rationale is that A, the defendant has consented to it, and B, that defendant gets some benefit from it, which is why the defendant's consenting to it. Right? He gets some, there's something about the outcome that's better for the defendant. In more recent years, it seems to be that very often what's quite explicitly at stake is the, are these collateral, direct or collateral consequences, either sentencing consequences or kind of deportation and sex offender registration consequences. Um, and C, that the, because many states require that the trial judge find a factual basis for the plea before accepting the plea. Not so everywhere, not true in Ohio, but in most states. Federal system, that's rule 11, right? That the judge has to find a factual basis for the plea before accepting the plea and entering a conviction upon it. Courts in many states hold that if you find a factual basis for the original charge that has different elements, that suffices for the factual basis for the fictional baseless charge, for which there's not sufficient evidence, right? For the bodily harm element of aggravated battery or the provocation element of the aggravated assault or whatever, whatever it might be. Okay. The more extreme version of this, at least in the abstract, is that sometimes prosecutors, I now would say defendants and trial courts all collude to go further and achieve a conviction. It's not simply to a crime defined in the code for which they act, lack evidence of one element, but that it's a non-existent crime that just doesn't exist at all in the code. And the catch here, too, is that they're not just making up offenses that just sound like they're made up out of thin air, like the crime of lecturing to audiences about criminal law and inducing boredom, or the crime of burning an American flag. Right? They're, they're, these are almost always attempt cases. right? But there are certain crimes that can't be attempted, at least under state law, are defined as uh, that the attempt law doesn't apply to, right, particularly in, in, in involuntary manslaughter offenses in a lot of states, right, or offenses that are done with a negligent or reckless state of mind, right, and that don't require intent. So they say it's hard. It doesn't make sense, right? We don't have a, a, a crime of attempted involuntary manslaughter because you can't attempt to kill someone by negligence. Right? And so courts make clear that this is a non-existent offense. We don't have this offense, but the defendant pled guilty to it. The prosecutor charged it. The trial court found a factual basis for the original charge that the defendant was charged with, not this made-up charge. Um, and they approved that conviction, affirmed that conviction on appeal, Again, because everyone seems happy with it, right? So you have a defense of this practice, at least, is that there's a nice system of checks and balances or, or safeguards, right, to this what could be a very worrisome practice. Right? It always occurs when two branches of government, to put it a bit formally, right, the executive and the prosecution and the judiciary are colluding or checking each other. The judges are checking the prosecutors in this odd task of prosecuting someone when they don't have evidence for the charge or even making up a charge that doesn't exist in the code, when they're circumventing the legislature in that way. And they always occur in the context in which the defendant is consenting to this and presumably gets some benefit from it, or at least the possibility of a benefit. And so you have that sort of set of safeguards, and it only occurs, as far as I can tell, ever in this sort of, in this sort of context. And I think that's appropriate, too. I join these 10 or so state Supreme Courts in that view, including the Wisconsin courts, that to put it a bit more abstractly than the courts would, I think, that there's 
that there's an imperfection to the code in, in its application in some cases, or there are good reasons of sort of justice and policy to avoid sticking to the code or the bounds of the code um, in the kinds of cases um, where it might otherwise mean that the prosecution doesn't get a conviction for someone who they're convinced in good faith is guilty, although it's, this is where one can debate, right? That they're not proceeding on the original charge because they don't have, they're not confident in the evidence that they can win a conviction, a trial with that, with that evidence, or that it would be very costly to a victim in order to proceed that way. But if you assume the prosecutors have really good faith evidence, and maybe good, good faith evidence that's not admissible in court, of the, pro of the defendant doing one thing, and the uh, resolution being that he gets some, there's some sanction and some public benefit for the negotiated charge to the base, through the baseless guilty plea and the baseless conviction. That's a kind of grand policy rationale for it. That's the one that the courts tend to point to. And a bit more abstractly, I think it, this agreement between both the defense and the other two branches of government provides some signal to the legislature that there are limitations to the code, that there may be reasons to amend the code, especially in the context where the motivation for this is not so much weak or questionable evidence on the prosecution side, so they're looking for something to be able to convict the person for that they, who they are convinced is guilty, but they don't have solid evidence for the original charge. Especially when the motivation, as it seems to be more and more in recent years, is the avoidance of these mandatory penalties, either direct criminal penalties or collateral penalties like immigration and sex offender registration. These kind of baseless convictions and baseless charges are an appropriate part of the dialogue between various government actors, to, between the executive branch and the judges and the legislature, about the efficacy and the appropriateness of these sanctions in particular cases. This, you think of it in a bit abstract way, as kind of feedback from the actors on the ground who know these cases the best, right? The trial judges and the prosecutors, back to the legislature who makes these policies sort of in the abstract. Maybe these mandatory penalties sounded like a good idea in the abstract. If you look at these cases up close day to day in the particular equities of each one, find e even prosecutors, right? If, in these particular cases, going to you know, considerable lengths that sound problematic, at least in the abstract, right? baseless pleas, to avoid the harsh penalties or consequences. I would tend to think prosecutors tend to favor more than, certainly more than defense, and, and tend to be amenable to as a general matter. If these mandatory or harsh consequences are something that even the prosecutors think ought to be avoided, that's a pretty significant signal, I think, to the legislature that maybe they need to be revisited. And I think it's an appropriate exercise of prosecutorial discretion, at least with respect to this baseless plea context, when you have the safeguards that are all, always present of both the judicial approval, the judicial examination in this context, and of the defendant's consent. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Okay, I know Professor Brown is eager to take questions, and we have about 10 minutes for that. So, uh, as you likely know, the best way to do it is to uh, raise your hand, and I'll recognize you, and then I'll engage in some incompetent explanation as to how you use the microphone. Uh, but Ryan will uh, save us by uh, automatically lighting it up. So now that we've established that process, um, questions, please. Uh, yes. I won't even begin to describe the process. Okay. Professor Fallon will help you. you out. Thank you. So what is your opinion of claims that I, I think the data supports that prosecutors sometimes charge differently depending on the race of the defendant or maybe the state in which the crime occurred? Um, yeah, so if I understand it right, I, I think of those as two very different questions, right? So to the extent we have any evidence that that race plays a factor. I think race is hardly a controversial position. I have to say that's an illegitimate um, grounds for distinct, distinguishing among cases. If I recall right, 
I don't mean to flatter your local prosecutor's office here, but I, re- I think I recall reading that um, Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office was one of the offices that brought in, the, I think it was maybe the Vera Institute, to sort of look at whether they were doing that sort of thing and made adjustments to charging policies um, to try to make sure they were not doing that kind of thing. Um, that is to have racial disparities in, in sort of enforcement practice. I think that's clearly legitimate. Um, so identifying it is the much more difficult uh, challenge, right, or uh, puzzle. Because it, it's often the case, I think, it's probably almost always the case, that there are well-grounded charges in the cases that they're brought. It's just a question of where enforcement resources or attention are being put such that the effect of enforcement is, 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 is disproportionate. Um, as to the differences across state lines, I think that's a tougher question, or just one on which there's more legitimate views for disagreement, right? So there's just different jurisdictions, different sovereigns, so to speak, and just have different policies about whether something's going to be criminal or not, like we see in the marijuana context, or, and how severe any particular conduct should be punished, like we see at least between federal and state policies, and drugs and other things. Federal policies are always more severe, right? Um, I think as an abstract matter, that's, that's appropriate in the federal system. I think it's, it's unfortunate and um, it feels random to individual defendants, right? And there are ways to that, that federalism contrast between, especially between state and federal power. So there are ways that it's administered that can be what I would consider unfair. It's not unconstitutional or illegal, but it's unfair. So one example is back in the 80s, there was a, a US attorney in the Southern District of New York. You might have heard of him. He's still occasionally in the news. Um, I had a policy called Federal Day. Every Monday or every Tuesday, they would take a given set of a particular kind of drug case from the state courts and put them, take them as federal cases. And so, so Offenders were supposed to realize they have a 20% chance as kind of state drug dealers that they might end up in the federal system and get a much harsher punishment. That, to me, feels inappropriately random. Uh, you know, there's an argument for it, but uh, I think that distinction should be what mostly it is the way federal and in a very broad sweep, I think, the way federal and state prosecutors divide up their work is that roughly the federal prosecutors take kind of bigger, more complex drug cases, and the states take the smaller stuff, but lots of exceptions to that, and lots of disputes around that, too. Other questions? Mel Johnson? Uh, you've given us examples of prosecutors charging offenses that they don't have adequate evidence for, but you've also referred to prosecutors charging offenses that don't exist in the criminal code. Can you give us some examples of that? Of offenses that don't exist in the code? Yeah, that have actually been charged. Yeah, so the attempted involuntary manslaughter charges are the example in, in several states. I forget my Wisconsin example that I have, but Wisconsin has a few of these. Um, there are, I, I think, as far as I recall, I think they're all attempt charges. So it's a, you know, it's maybe it's a technicality, but it's, it's also true. So it's true that. These courts say, this exists, this offense of attempted involuntary manslaughter does not exist in this state. In cases where that instruction is given to a jury and a jury convicts, that conviction has to be overturned because that offense does not exist. But if that conviction is achieved through a negotiated guilty plea, courts will affirm that non-existent conviction. Um, so I, I, I think they're all in the category of attempted offenses when the for which the mens rea is negligence or recklessness. Was there a question over here? Yes, can you press the button? Thanks. So I'm struggling with this sort of distinction on uh, discretion and the mere fact that if you exercise that discretion and you may not say a reviewing court may not agree with it, is it wrong? I mean, because inherent in giving someone discretion is the ability to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you still into discretion? 
now that you're I, I, on the Court of I, Appeals, or has your view changed? Well, I, it, I'm trying to figure out how to okay. weigh and sort of assess that, because you also... I just wanted to give adequate context for uh, well, our, but, our visit. But you also alluded to the court sort of creating fiction, this legal fiction, which courts can do, yeah. because they have that discretion. Yeah. And please do not say abuse discretion. We don't say that in Wisconsin. It's always the erroneous exercise of discretion. <laughs> the judges are very sensitive. Duly noted. Um, yes, yeah, to the first version of the question, right? The power to uh, exercise discretion is the power to get it wrong. I guess I would be very law professorish and, and you know, ask what, what you mean by getting it wrong. We need to define those terms, right? So. The legal scope of U.S. prosecutors' discretion, state and federal, there's very little you can do to get wrong. Right? You can do, if you have probable cause to file a charge, you can pursue the charge. Um, you can definitely get things wrong as a matter of policy or as a matter of morality, as a matter of good practice, as a matter of yeah, sensible public policy. Um, but then you're in the realm of a policy debate or a moral debate that the courts don't have any authority to speak to prosecutors about. Is that responsive, or do you have a follow-up? Well, Maybe it, I misunderstood it. So, well, yeah. no, 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 I think I, it is, it, but it, I want to... It, it, is, it is responsive, but I, I will say in terms of the definition of getting it wrong is probably something that I subjectively may not agree with, because we can all look at a particular question or issue or decision. So if you don't agree with it, is that necessarily wrong, or is that an erroneous exercise of discretion? Of prosecutor discretion. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I would say there's very little. I'm struggling to think of any example where I could say prosecutors exercised erroneous uh, discretion. What is it? Uh, or they abused their discretion. Um, other than just as a matter of policy disagreement. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Just a second, Ed, is there a question right behind you? Do you have a question or is that just, okay, so Professor Fallon, this will be our last question here and then we'll be out in the forum. First of all, thank you for, for joining us. It was a very illuminating discussion. Um, so in, in sort of following up on, on uh, Judge Donald's point of view. You know, what, what could be the reaction of a judge who feels the, the discretion was not exercised appropriately? Um, you know, I think we see in the federal system that sometimes the federal judges have pulled out the big gun and have, when they see a statute being applied to perhaps what the judge views as innocent conduct or conduct that should not, even it may literally fall within the statute, should not have been charged the only option is for the judge to interpret the statute in a narrow fashion. In a narrow fashion. In a narrow yeah. fashion. Yeah. And, and preclude a whole category, potentially, of, of charging as a matter of law through the interpretation. So what, what do you see as, what can the judiciary do when they see perhaps overcharging? Yeah, so I thought you were going to go with a different example. So, that, so you know, for, the, for the example of judges having the power to respond through narrow interpretation of statutes, that's, uh, that's certainly one judicial strategy. I could think of examples. I could think of the federal um, 1001 statute, the false statement statute, until the Supreme Court decided otherwise. Lots of circuit courts had narrowly interpreted that statute to exempt a category of cases that prosecutors were bringing that they thought was inappropriate. The so-called exculpatory no statements were someone their only false statement to a federal official is to say, no, I didn't do the crime, when asked if they did the crime. Um, well, that's an example, and that's an entirely legitimate exercise of judicial power to narrowly interpret a statute um, in ways that restrict prosecutors' application of that statute. Um, but there's lots of statutes that federal judges, I guess state judges, disagree with and object to where they can't use that strategy feasibly, right? So these drug statutes I talked about are clearly one. There's lots of federal uh, judicial decisions, including one from my fellow University of Virginia alum, Judge Gleason, who was formerly, until recently, on the Eastern District of New York bench. Um, and my 
now, again, criminal law colleague uh, Paul Cassell on the Utah Law Faculty, who was a federal district judge in Utah for a while, um, who wrote well-known decisions among the people who read these sorts of things, really um, lambasting prosecutors for excessively harsh charging and screaming at Congress to change the law and saying that this is just completely inappropriate and I feel terrible having to impose this sentence that is completely unjust, but the prosecutor made me do it and the law makes me do it. The, some, sometimes in scenarios like that, there's just no, there's no judicial recourse. Right? There's no, you can't narrowly interpret those statutes to stop prosecutors from doing that. So I want to invite everyone to the Zilber Forum, which of course is right outside where we're going to have a reception. I want to thank all of you for coming here this evening, and I especially want to thank Professor Brown for being with us and for a very interesting Barak lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.